For the second half of the evening, we have on stage Robert Kortenhoeven, also from Berlin, this evening, especially for us. And he is going to talk about Shoot Designers Code. So Robert Kortenhoeven himself, he is a designer, a coder, and a creative leader. So he's, he's all three. Uh, he has more than 18 years of experience working for startups and consultancy firms. And he also, I think he started at Philips Design, right? Who is from Philips Design? I know there are a lot of people here sitting up from Philips Design. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is Robert Kortenhoeven. Thank you. So, is it on? I, yeah, you can hear me? Okay, perfect. So, I uh, see a few familiar faces here. Um, so, I'm Robert, as mentioned. Uh, I'm going to talk to a topic that's uh, hopefully connecting a little bit to the previous topic and the, few, the two talks you've seen so far. Um, but first I wanted to t touch upon uh, a bit of my background and a bit of history. So, um, as mentioned, Philips Design, actually where I started my career about, I think, 15, 17, 16 years ago. So, a while ago. Um, as mentioned, I've worked in different environments. I've, environments. I've worked in startups, I've worked in corporates, I've worked in, uh, in consultancy, ag agency environments. The kind of products I typically worked on, it's, it's a very diverse mix. Um, some actual Philips products in here, uh, but anything uh, that's mobile, TV, desktop, uh, but also in terms of the, the, the products itself, it, not just products, but also services. So, so in terms of experience, I've seen a lot of these different places and a lot of different people I've worked with. Today, I wanted to talk a bit about how we actually get to the final result and what, as designers, we can actually do to, to influence and, and actually um, have control over the final product. So first, I wanted to talk a bit about um, where I am today and, and how I've gotten to where I am today. So I mentioned corporate, and corporate has been a somewhat reoccurring theme in my, in my past career. Um, and at some point, uh, it was going really well in terms of, if you buy corporate standards, like nice position, nice salary, company, car. But at some point, I was thinking, what the hell am I doing? And you've probably heard already some of the frustrations and, and challenges you face in a corporate environment. And I was like, Thought this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something else. I stop the bus, I'm gonna get off. So this is exactly what I did. Because for me, my passion has always been to actually be very close to the products we build and the final result and actually building things, bringing to, things to life. And if you think about it, as designers, this is, this is what we love doing, right? We love to create and br bring things to life. So today, if you walk past my screen, um, I, still, I still do all this management, that's, that's part of the job, but often you'll also find this kind of stuff on my screen. And for a designer, that might seem very strange. Uh, a lot of people are wondering, what the hell is this guy doing again? He's just sitting there with his code on his screen. What, what, what's, he, what's he trying to get at? Um, so today, I'm actually at IAM. Uh, IAM is one of the, in Berlin circles at least, it's one of the more well-known established startups. Uh, we do photography. And what I do at IAM is actually keep building design culture. And I think Harold made a great point about design led not being about leading a team, leading people, or leading a team. For me, it's very important what I do at IAM to build a design culture. Um, that obviously goes into things like also everything we talked about in terms of uh, user research, service design, because it is a service we're developing. But what I want to talk about today is much more towards the end of the process. So what I want to talk about is uh, if designers should be coding. Actually, that's the title of this talk, but it's actually not really what I want to, want to focus too much on. Um, it is a good question, of course, should designers be coding? Uh, because back to what I said earlier, we want to bring things to life. We want, life. We want to make things tangible. Um, but more importantly, um, there's, there's a lot of background and uh, there's actually uh, a more important thing that we need to resolve and we need to focus on. So there's a bit more to it. Um, so I mentioned craft, uh, or I mentioned at least the value of bringing, uh, creating things and shaping things as designers, and this is what we love doing. So craft, if you think about the original definition of craft, is really like this hands-on. You see there's a lot of mess, there's dirt everywhere. Uh, we're trying to create something. Eventually, out of this process, something emerges, and, and you might like it, you might hate it, 
but at least that's the process of craft, and, and this is what we should be doing as designers. But if you look at the digital space, um, it's a little different, right? If you think about digital designers, user experience designers, UI designers, however you want to call them, uh, it, it's a, we're, we're quite a bit removed from that, like, here's, here's what I created, here's what I crafted. Sure, we create beautiful mock-ups, but there's, there's, there's quite a challenge. So today I want to really focus on this last part, so the, the implementation phase. And, and especially what happens there and some of the challenges and the things we put in between us as designers and the final product. So let's talk about implement. So there's us, the designer on the left, and there's a developer, software engineer. Uh, they're actually building, the, they're bringing to life the ideas that we generated, uh, the ideas that we mocked up in our beautiful sketch mockups, in our user journeys. Actually, the user journeys are sitting somewhere there at the, at the front of the process. We create prototypes. Um, we, we actually create spec documents, and then if you work in a, in a modern software development environment, whether it be a startup or corporate, you're probably going to create some form of tickets on a thing called Jira, or if you're familiar with these tools, this is what software engineers use today to plan and track their progress. Um, they're very useful tools, but also it, it actually requires a lot of extra management, and it requires even people to manage that. So we put another person in between us and the final product. Actually, the final product is not even visible anymore. So we're dealing with a lot of extra overhead. We're having meetings, we're doing communication, we're creating, we're creating long emails with feedback. Uh, we might put the, the, the feedback in the tickets on these beautiful tools that we have. But still, there's a lot of extra, extra activities and extra work that happens in between. So what we should aim for, and this is really the core of what I want to get to today, is how can we get a bit closer to the final product? What can we do to get more control over what the user actually ends up getting in their hands and what they get to play with? So the first thing you, can, you obviously should do, can do and should do, is uh, put everyone together. Um, Philips Design was always a nice example. Philips Design was an amazing place to work. Uh, I mean, a lot of people sitting here can vouch for that, but uh, the problem was uh, often that we were quite far removed from the people actually building the products. Sure, we would go and visit them with our badges and we could go to some other Philips building and then spend an afternoon discussing what was right and what was wrong. But putting people together in the same room, on the same floor, in the same office makes a lot of sense. And we're actually doing that today. A lot of companies have moved to this model, a lot of change in the right direction in that way. But it doesn't actually solve the core of the problem. We're still not quite close to the final product. Sure, we're sitting next to the guy building it. We can look at the screen and start pointing at things and make comments and get into arguments, uh, which often what happens. But we need, to, we need to focus on what we can do ourselves as designers. Sort of, I, I, div I created these three pillars. I also have pillars, by the way. Uh, the pillars are for you, though. They're not for the end users. Uh, or for your stakeholders. So the first pillar is prototyping. And this is really about bringing your ideas to life. And what's really amazing, if you look at the design tools you have to your disposal today, um, it's so much different from 10 years ago. Today we have a tool called Sketch, which is what about 90% of UI designers actually are using. These tools are amazing. Like you, you can create something and then they have a little tool that you can put on your phone. And while you're drawing, you can see it on your phone and you can give the phone to your CEO and you can say, hey, look, if we do it like this or we do it like that, by the way, it don't work like that. That's a terrible process. But the tool is really amazing. You can see it on the device. And this is really the key point here. When you want to develop and design something, as soon as possible, you want to see it on a target device. And we were talking about how you can test and prototype the experience. This is, this is a small little part of it. The other part are prototyping tools. And if you're a designer, this should look very familiar. Uh, but we live, I would say, in the golden age of prototyping tools. And prototyping is really about bringing your ideas to life to an extent where people can play with it, which is great for user testing. It's great for evaluating your ideas within the company. If you want to present it to the CEO, you say, hey, look here, have a look at it, have a play with it. So not just look at it, but actually have a play with it. There's many different stages and ways in which you can prototype, but it's very fundamental to how we work as designers. So prototyping is key. But prototyping, and this is where my first pillar ends and we go into the second pillar, 
Because with prototyping, we still put something in between us and the final product, because we're creating an alternate reality. This is what I call it. The alternate reality, it can be your Photoshop, your sketch mockups, it can be your prototype, but it's not the final product. What we do with this, we hand it over to a developer and we say like, hey, look, I created this beautiful thing. Now, can you go and build that thing one-on-one, -on -one? Just, just exactly like it's here? And then it takes a few weeks and you go back and you sit down with him and say, well, what the hell did you do there, right? <laughs> Um, we, uh, I see the people sitting on the front row, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I, I know this process. We've all done this, we've all been there. But the point is, how can we actually start to control and play with that final product? So, get rid of the boundary, and we go to the second pillar, polishing the product. So how can we, as designers, actually control and manipulate the final product? Um, Shiny cars. Um, it needs to be as shiny as this. Uh, in Germany, they love their cars. A lot of shiny cars are shiny German cars. Um, for you, though, as a designer, the reality of, is often a little different, right? It's not as shiny as this. If you're a web developer, this should look somewhat familiar, right? You've, you've seen this if you manipulate CSS. So as a web developer, you're somewhat already doing this. But if you're developing native software for iOS, for Android, for the Mac, whatever platform watches these days, TVs, it's, it's much harder to do these kind of things, but you can. The problem is we don't engage in a conversation with the engineers and the software developers to actually enable these kind of levels of control often. So part of that is uh, coming in with the microscope, with the magnifying glass. Actually, I've, I've worked with a software developer, a front-end developer who would build iOS apps. Well, actually, I have one of these on his desk. If you, see, if you see a guy like that, you should definitely hire him because it means he has, he's, he's meticulous. And that's what we need to be as designers, right? We need to be meticulous. But the problem is, if the people you're working with are not meticulous, you can be as meticulous as you want, but it's not going to do anything. It's just going to end up in frustration. So again, we need to get control over the final product. Um, this designer, that was actually me. Uh, Vidu is our, our lead software developer at IM. And he tweeted this. Uh, it, was, it was kind of funny. Um, the, the tool, though, that he's talking about, this is uh, Apple's development tool. So Interface Builder is part of Apple's core set of developer tools. And these tools, um, this is as close as you can get when it comes to iOS development, in this case, to actually manipulating and controlling the final product. So here, I'm actually playing around with layouts and I'm manipulating it. Problem with these tools, though, is it's what you see is not quite what you get. So remember this term, because you can use it in, in lots of different contexts. But the, the point here is, the, what, what you saw, and let me go back, what you see here, this doesn't look nothing like the final product. There's not even an image there. So what's this going to look like, right? So it's useful, but it only gets you so far. So this brings me to the next point. Uh, this is actually a development tool you can use today on iOS, Android. It's even sports web. And this is sort of starting to hint at where we're heading to. This tool, uh, what you see on the right side here, is actually the application running on the phone. It's a simulator, but it is the application running on my phone. On the left side, you see me just drawing things. And what's actually happening, while the app is already on the phone, I can redesign things, I can change things. So it's live design. Call it live design, I, we had, for lack of a better term. This is a tool called Paint Code. They've been really been pushing for this, this um, closer, direct, more direct control for designers over the final product. So it's, you can see this is, this is hinting at something. But it's not quite there yet. I mean, it does, it does this one thing, which is like all the buttons and assets and icons you have in your app, whether it's Android or web or iOS, you can redesign those and control those. But it's not quite the same as building an entire app, of course. So the third phase, and this brings me to the third pillar, uh, is building it. So as designers, uh, can you actually just, I mean, we were already playing around with Xcode, right? Why not take the next step and just have a fiddle with it? Uh, and this is really where it's, it gets important. How do you do that? Because obviously you walk up to the software engineer and say, so tomorrow can, I want, I'm going to join your team, uh, hire me as an iOS developer, junior, of course, I'll, I'll do some reading and we'll get started tomorrow. It's not going to work that way. So you need to find the entryways. Uh, I mean, on the web, we're already, we're already in a very good place. I mean, web design has always been sort of, like you've sort of been playing around with the final product. I don't know, any of you use WordPress or Squarespace? Yeah? The, oh, 
two people. Great. <laughs> it's really good. Um, but there's a couple of new tools popping up. So there's, there's this tool called Front uh, Webflow. These two tools, uh, the services actually, but they, they are online tools and they allow you to build websites. And what's really great about these tools is as a designer, you can just build a final product. Of course, you need to put some context around this. We're not building web apps here. We're not building uh, the online banking service that ABN AMRO is going to gonna launch tomorrow. You're building landing pages here, which are typically in a marketing context. So it's very important that these tools, they're great. They give us a lot of control over the final, we can actually build the final product, but that product only gets so far. So it's good, it's a good trend. But then if you look at native uh, application development, uh, bring, going back to IAM example, uh, we recently launched this new feature, it's called IAM Selects. It allows you to, it actually suggests pictures from your camera roll um, that make sense to upload, at least from our perspective. And to develop this UI, so what you see underneath is the camera roll, what you see at the top is actually the, the little feature that we added. Uh, to, to actually build the detailed interaction of what we did with the design team, we actually built a native prototype. So we built something that was using actual code that was almost the same as what ended up in the final product. The great thing about this, obviously you, you can't just come in and start building this as a designer. You need to have the experience and you need to have the skills to do that. But once you get to that point, what's really nice with this is you can go to the developer and you can show them things where you say like this fine grain control, this, these details that you see here. You can obviously try to explain it to him and he try to, try to replicate it. But in this case, we could actually copy paste some of the pieces into the final product. So I can proudly state that actually a tiny bit of code in the actual IAM client that you can download from the App Store is code written by me. Um, that's, that's, that's sort of what I'm getting at with this. Um, the level of control and uh, the, the fidelity and what you can do with to, to the final product, we don't have that today. We're lacking that. And we need to go on a journey where we can actually get to that. And we need to find a ways to do that. So one big trend that's really contributing to this, and that actually got me into it, so a bit of the personal background again. Um, for me, I started about maybe 10, 12 years ago um, because I was always prototyping. And pillar one, that's always been part of my work. But I always felt like, wouldn't it be great if I could actually build actual software, things that you can use yourself so it started a bit playing around with building design tools because there's so many gaps in the kind of tool set that we have. At prototyping was actually one of them, where I felt like if I could build something myself, that would be really nice. So that was my starting point. But the problem was 10, 12 years ago, there was no documentation. I mean, you could buy a thick book on how to build a calculator on, on the Mac, but that's not very compelling, right? Especially if you're doing something that's maybe you're building a new TV UI and you want to prototype that with some nice fancy video. Nothing like that was easy to do. But then iOS and the iPhone came along and it changed everything. If you go online today, you type in uh, iOS code tutorial, you probably get like 100,000 tutorial results. It, there's so much out there. There's videos, there's some great podcasts. So there's never been a better time to actually get into coding and get started with this stuff. The problem is there's a bit of a stigma towards it. And what I really like with Apple is they're trying to break this. So if you're not familiar with this, Apple launched uh, a tool, it's actually a, a, um, an iOS app for the iPad called uh, Swift Playgrounds. And they built this specifically for kids to learn how to code. And it's a very playful way. It's almost like a cartoony storytelling way to get kids familiarized with code. Point with that is the code, coding language has changed. It's becoming more and more accessible. It's becoming more and more readable. And these tools have been introduced. And then there's all these resources. Um, one thing I want to leave you with on that, there's a website called Stack Overflow. If you ever have a question like, hey, I want to animate a video into the screen in iOS, type that in Google. Probably the first result will be Stack Overflow. There will be bits of code there that you can just copy paste. This is how I started. You talk to a developer about this, you tell them you do that, they will, they will, they will, eh. <laughs> it's, this is not done if you're a developer, but for us as designers, it's so amazing because I can take that bit and I can just make it work. And that's the point about it. Just do it. Don't care. Don't care what they say. Don't care what they think. So three pillars, remember these. Um, if you're doing one or two already, excellent. But think about three because three is just really compelling. It's really interesting to be there. A couple of things on what's next. I see I have one and a half minutes left. AI, 
uh, so going back to the topic of coding, uh, everyone's like, ah, oh my god, uh, they're going to steal our jobs. Um, we're all going to lose our jobs tomorrow. Uh, there's going to be a machine, there's going to be a robot sitting at my desk. He's going to do all my administrative processing, my spreadsheets. Point is, um, there's actually an opportunity for, for people who do that kind of work here. If you're doing any kind of data analysis, if you're doing repetitive tasks, have a look at Python, because it's amazing. I actually use Python in my day-to-day -day work to automate some of the design work we're doing. Actually, I want to spend more of my time doing creative work, so I'm trying to automate the boring tasks so we don't have to do that repetitive work as designers. Python is a great tool for that, but Python works for everyone. Anyone who does any of that repetitive work, data analysis, get started tomorrow. Again, Google it. I want to start learning Python. There's a gazillion tutorials out there, videos. It's, it's really fun. Um, you need to have a right mindset, of course. Uh, you need to have the motivation and the drive. Last one, VR, AR, mixed reality. We're all talking about it. Uh, it's, it's amazing bus around it. Uh, Apple and Google are launching all these, these great pieces of technology. It's on the phone right now. It's going to be on your face eventually. This is the next paradigm shift. Uh, you, can, you can challenge me on that after the, the drinks, but it's a given. So um, no negotiation, but you can challenge me. Uh, the point with this, however, um, is not so much that technology or what it's going to do for us, but it's actually the tools that we have to our disposal today and that are actually being used right now to build some of those cool apps that you can download now for your iPhone on the App Store. So all those AR kit demos that you see, a lot of them are either built in a tool called Unreal Engine or Unity. This is Unreal Engine. I use it a lot myself because what I find really amazing about this is you're sculpting. You're in the environment and actually to the point now where you can put on the VR headset and with the controllers you can actually start building and sculpting the environment around you. So remember that thing I showed you earlier where we, man we were manipulating the, the actual design on the product? This, is, this goes even further than that. We're in the product and we're sculpting around us. And this is, for me, this is fascinating. And if you think about like the thing that's going to be on your face and you're going to be looking around and you can just create and, and you can add interactivity, the moment I put that tree there, I can run into it or I can shake the tree and apples will fall out. I mean, or oranges. That is going to be amazing. And I think that really shows us where we should be in terms of mindset as designers and developers. So I'm out of time. But the key thing also is start thinking about uh, unifying skills and disciplines and start tearing down boundaries between people and, and, and job titles. Because in the end, it's about empowering yourself and getting closer to the final product. So think about hybrid developers, designers, product managers. We have product managers that I am doing design work. We don't care. It's, if it makes sense, they should be doing it. So don't fight it, embrace it. Look for the opportunities, be curious, create something. So go tomorrow and use Python, use Swift, doesn't matter. Find an opportunity in your day-to-day -day work where you see like, hey, you can actually build something here. Let's try this. Maybe somebody else did it already for you. Then you can take the work and start improving on it, open source. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Also fail. I mean, obviously, the, 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 the acceptance of the fact that you're going to fail with this is, is a given. You need, to, you need to have that as an underlying rationale. If you assume you're going to be successful in day one, obviously it's not going to happen. But you need to persist through it. And then you learn new things. And that's very, for me at least, it's been very gratifying to do that. So move a little closer. Finally, get close to that final product and find ways to, to control it. So remember my pillars. Uh, find the ways to actually manipulate and affect the, the end result and work together with the people around you to see how you can enable that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Do we have any questions for Robert? Any questions? Think about it. So, uh, Robert? Yeah. Um, you talk about designers, should they code, should they not code? You talk about, you know, being a, as a designer, being more direct on the end product. Mm -hmm. So, I also think that the capabilities of a designer or a coder mm -hmm. should be a little bit different than that it is now. Yeah. Right. Uh, Do you have any advice? 
Yeah, of course, uh, there's a very important point about when I say designers coding and building things, you're not going to replace the engineer. Keep that in mind as well, like, and explain that to them. Set the expectation level so they don't get worried. Um, very important. But I think, uh, I mean, we're talking about user experience design here, we're talking about service design. There's so, the expectations these days towards, uh, if you call yourself a UX designer, the, the expectation level is like this, especially if you look at startup environments. I mean, you look in Berlin, uh, a lot of startups in Berlin, they're, they're typically quite young people starting these companies. Um, they think like, oh, we should get a designer in to, to do some stuff. Let, let's hire this one guy and he's going to do everything. He's going to do a branding, he's going to do a user experience. Maybe he can do some coding even and he can build stuff. So the expectation level is very high, but I think as a designer you just need to accept that the expectation level is high, manage it, but also push yourself. Don't restrict yourself. I know there's, there's something to say for, for, for vertical skills and people who are vi very good at visual. You, you don't want to challenge that. I always tell them, like, you need to have a second skill, like it be, be it motion or something else, but you might have a core skill. But I think for a lot of designers, it's very important that they broaden their skill set and they just accept that you need to continuously push yourself. Like, what am I not doing today that I could be doing tomorrow? And, and just, just pick it up, try it. If it doesn't work, great, but at least you tried it and you feel like, okay, I can talk from experience that that's not my thing. So, yeah, I don't hope that answers the question. Yeah, sure, yeah. and I think it's also yeah. fun, or more fun to do more things, you yeah. know, to have more capabilities, yeah. more skills, yeah. being more in the end product. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Question? Yeah. Yeah, could you, I, I, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your, uh, for your wonderful story. Mm -hmm. Could you explore a little bit more on the fact that you mentioned artificial intelligence? You know, yeah. it's moving up, it's a big black monster, mm -hmm. it's going to eat everybody. But behind it, there's this whole experience you're talking about based on algorithms. Mm -hmm. And I see you being involved in developing or instructing the right people to do the right algorithms. Yeah. Right or wrong? Uh, well, are not you, me personally, but, but our company, yes, it's a big part of what we do. So our technology analyzes the imagery. We have actually a team of 10 people just spending all their time developing algorithms, analyzing imagery, yes. And how are you personally moving to that field? So for us, I think it's very interesting. Um, first of all, um, it's not so much, uh, in, in our case, it's, it's, it's a very specific thing about image analysis. But if you look at the competence of machine learning and AI development in general, um, we need to also, looking at that from a design perspective, you need to also almost start treating that as a form of ethnography. So as, as designers, we do a lot of user research, but I think we're getting to a point where we need to also have a form of, it's not user research, it's machine research, understanding what these algorithms are doing and, and why they're doing it. Because they're almost, like, they're almost like organisms, right? They make decisions. Why did they make that decision? The bias is a big point of discussion in, in, in machine learning. It's actually something we run into on a day-to-day -day basis, avoiding that you get, that people get misidentified, a dog gets identified as a person in a picture, right? But that can have very nasty consequences if you do it wrong. So you need to build in the right level. You, you should avoid the bias, but the bias is there. I mean, we, we know the discussion around Facebook and, uh, the, the, the content that they pick based on what others pick and that immediately comes from humans, right? So the bias that people have tends to mirror itself into, into the product. So I think from a designer perspective to answer the question, we need to also start looking at that as a form of research. We need to understand that as designers. So yes, hope that answers it. Does it answer the question? Yes, it yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think time is up, right? yeah. guys. So he's in the bar later on. So grab a beer, talk to him. Uh, he lives in Berlin, so he likes beer. So talk to him during the drinks. <laughs>